Well, thank you for, for the introduction and the opportunity to, to speak here. Uh, indeed, I apologize for not being able to make it today. Uh, I really hoped till the last minute that I could get a train, but I, I could make it. Uh, so hopefully next time. Um, so uh, today in the second lecture, I'm going to uh, speak about noise invariational algorithms and classical simulation of quantum computing. And I'm going to uh, have um, several goals. So the, the main goal of the talk is really to understand what one needs to do to quantify quantum advantage. So it's not really what is in the title of the lecture, um, but you, you'll understand uh, the link with the title of the lecture. And to understand how, how one can quantify quantum advantage, I will take uh, two examples, two, pra two, two quite practical examples. One which is uh, trying to solve an optimization problem with um, a quantum computer, uh, and one where one uses random quantum circuits, um, and you'll understand what it is. And what I'll try to convey today is to understand the link between quantum advantage, decoherence, entanglement, these kind of things. And if you want to understand these kind of questions, you need to learn about the classical simulation of quantum computers. And since uh, uh, Bruno already talked about the digital part most, uh, mostly, and talked about VQE, the variational quantum eigensolver, I will mostly focus on analog quantum computing, although I will also mention a bit uh, gate-based computing yes. in my lecture. And maybe before, uh, before I start, I can motivate a bit uh, this talk by uh, saying a few words about where I work. So Atos is a big company which builds uh, high performance computers or supercomputers, which are the type of computers that you're used to using when you do uh, large scale simulations for material science, for physics, for chemistry. This is the kind of computers that, uh, that physicists like to use uh, when they do big computations. And we also have, so we have academic clients, but we also have private companies. And these uh, companies want to understand whether they can use quantum computers um, in, so, in, so together with classical computers in order to get some advantage by using some quantum computing power. And so the kind of uh, questions that we have in our research and development group uh, is really to try to quantify what one can get out of quantum processors in the presence of physical defects, which will always be there. And today I will be mostly concerned with the uh, quantum computers that we have in the lab today. So really what, what people call noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, NISC computers. And I will not, um, I will not uh, talk about quantum error correction because you know it will be the fourth lecture uh, in this series of lectures that David is going to talk about. So today, so the, the, the focus of this talk is really what can one do with noisy quantum computers? And uh, to be very concrete, I will, I will try to be as concrete as possible and take uh, very concrete examples. And the first part of the lecture, so the first one hour and a half or so, is going to be devoted to, to, be devoted uh, to the study of an optimization problem uh, on a noisy quantum computer. So it's really going to be about solving an solving optimization problem. An optimization problem. And maybe what we can do for the sound, maybe if Andrea, you can mute your sound because I have echo. Uh, yeah. and that maybe that's better this way. And if there are questions, of course, I'm happy to, to take them if it's possible, even though it may be a bit complicated. But if some someone wants to ask a question, I'm happy to answer during the talk, of course. So I'm going to... Uh, tell you about how one can solve an optimization problem on a noisy analog quantum computer. And for this, I'm going to take an example uh, from uh, a very practical example where suppose uh, I want to, to charge electrical vehicles um, and I have several electrical vehicles to charge and um, and let's say I can represent uh, by this bar here um, the kind of charging task. So that's one electrical vehicle that I charge. 
And then there's a there's a second vehicle, for instance, that comes in at, at this stage here. This is another uh, charge charging event that I want to do. And here I have yet another charging event that I would like to, to, to do. And then here is another charging event. So this is here, as you've probably guessed, time here. And what I want to understand in the problem that I'm going to try to solve is how many um, electrical vehicles can I charge with the following constraint that I cannot charge two vehicles at a time. And so here, of course, I want to maximize this number of electrical vehicles. And you can see here probably that the, the, the vehicles that I, that I can charge at the same time are, for instance, this one and this one, because they don't have an overlap. Whereas, for instance, here you see that there's an overlap between these two here, there's an overlap between those two here, and there's an overlap over those two here. So for instance, here the answer to the problem that to my problem would be two, because among all the charging events uh, that I presented here, uh, basically I can charge only two. There's another possible solution would be which would be, for instance, to charge. Um, so for instance, here in blue, this one and this one. So two would so two would correspond to this as well. Or I could do, for instance, this and this. So this, in this case that I drew here, there are many solutions to the problem. And this is a very interesting uh, problem that, for instance, EDF is working on when they're looking at uh, so charging fleets of electrical vehicles, which is which which has become very important and fashionable uh, now. And it turns out that I can um, I can turn this very practical problem into a, an abstract problem in the form of an optimization problem on a graph. And what I'm going to do is um, uh, have one vertex per task. So let's let's label, for instance, the task. So this is A, B, C, and D. And I can, so for instance, say that uh, here we have, so let's say, let's call it, let, let's call this A, let's call this B, this is C, and this is D. So I'm going to draw one vertex per task. And I'm going to draw an edge between two vertices whenever there's an overlap between the tasks. So for instance, between A and B, there is a link. Between B and D, there is a link. Between uh, C and D, there is a link. And there is a link also between, uh, between B. Well, I think that's it. That's all the links there are. And A, did I forget something? No. And so now, the task of finding uh, the number of tasks that I can do in parallel, so is equivalent to finding uh, the the maximum number of vertices, the the largest set of vertices with no edges between with no ed edges between each pair of vertices. So let me take an example. For instance, here A and D share no edges, so they're a possible solution. And so here we could play the game also for B B and C works, for instance. So that's the problem that I want to solve. And so to put it in more mathematical terms, this problem here is called the maximum independent set. And it turns out that this problem is a very hard problem. Namely, if you have n vertices, the price on a classical computer to solve such a problem, namely to find the maximum set, the, the maximum uh, independent set, is a problem that is exponential in n. In other words, so this this is one of the famous NP-complete algorithms, um, the NP-complete problems, and therefore it's very complicated to solve on classical computers. It doesn't mean that people have are not trying to solve them on classical computers because they're really practical problems. But but either you have to pay an exponential price to find the solution, or you have to find an approximate solution that is good enough uh, for for this. So just to be sure we're on the same page, uh, and as a warm up, uh, I prepared a small uh, quiz here just to so it's it's a very easy quiz where. So the way it works is that uh, you, if you have an internet connection, so a smartphone or your laptop, uh, hopefully there's a, there's a Wi-Fi inside or there's 4G inside the room, um, you can connect to wooklapcom slash QDRQC, QDRQC. And then in principle, it's automatic. Then, then you will see the question and you can pick 
uh, you can pick uh, the answer that you like. And here, the, the question that I'm asking is just to be sure that we're, uh, so that everything is clear. Here, what I drew is, is one graph with some edges. And I put in red uh, the uh, vertices that I, that I claim are inside an independent set. And the goal of this question is here for you to select what is the maximum independent set. So it's a very easy question, but it's, it's just to make sure that uh, the goal of the problem is clear. OK, let's, let's see what you guys think. OK, so most of you picked uh, this, uh, this graph here, which is the correct answer. So we removed. So this one uh, is not correct because you have one edge between this, these red dots here. And this one is not correct for the same reason. This one is an independent set where there's only one atom. And, and this one is the maximum you can do. It's one of the possible solutions. We could have picked other solutions. And now, basically, the game, uh, so here it's a very, very easy example. But now the game is going to be to solve this kind of problem um, with a quantum computer and see how it performs with respect to a classical computer or with the exponential algorithm uh, that when that that one uses on classical computers. And just to give you uh, an idea of how one solves this problem on a classical computer, so on, on a, the classical algorithm for, 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 for this problem, which is called a maximum independent set problem, so I'm going to, for short, I'm going to call it the MIS problem. So of course, one, the exponential algorithm just consists in picking all the different possibilities uh, and, and then seeing what is the one which has uh, the, largest, uh, the, the largest weight. And so in practice, how this works is that you, you can, what, what you can do is say, when you pick a set of vertices, so for instance, so here I have five vertices that I called A, B, C, D. And what I could say is that if I pick uh, B and D, so if, if, if the solution that I like is B and D, so let's call it B and D. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to encode this solution as a, as, a, as a bit string where I'm going to say that A is not in the set, so I put a 0. B is in the set, so I put a 1. C is not in the set, so I put 0. And D is in the set, and, I, and, and therefore I call it 1. So basically, a generic solution is a, a series of bits, so B1 uh, until, uh, in fact, I'm going to call it N, N1. So I'm going to call it n1 until n large n. And basically, if ni equals 0, then it doesn't belong to the set. And if ni equals 1, it belongs to the set. It belongs. And then what I want to know is if you give me a bit string, so this, this solution here, so what I'm going to call a, for instance, so a is, the bit, is a bit string, a string of bits. And if you give me a bit string, I can tell you uh, if it's an independent set. And, and hopefully, if I enumerate all these bit strings, I will find uh, the solution. That's the brute force algorithm. And so if you count the number of possible uh, such bit strings, it's 2 to the power n bit strings. And so what you can do if you have a lot of time on your hands is just enumerate all the possibilities and find the one which has the largest uh, the largest number of uh, sets inside. So in other words, what you're going to try to maximize is a very easy uh, cost function, which is you do the sum of the ni's, so where, where i goes from 1 to n. So that counts the number of vertices in your set. But you want to, to these ni's to have a very particular property which is that if i and j, so if i and j uh, are in the edges of your graph, that's the ensemble that I'm going to call E, then you want n i and j to be zero. So let me repeat. So the score of a bit string a, so any bit string a defined in yellow here, the score of the bit string is going to be the sum over all its bits, ni, 
And, and I do this, this sum here only if the bit string is such that ni and j is zero. Okay? Any question on this? Okay, so I see. So of course I cannot really see if you're happy or not, but I'll I'll assume that you're happy. Okay, so here uh, that's that's uh, that's the way that I'm going to uh, to put in mathematical form. So, in other words, the problem that I'm going to solve is an optimization problem, where I'm going to try to maximize this cost function here. So by just summing over the bits of uh, my 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 bit strings. And this, of course, is an exponential algorithm. So if you reach a number of bit strings, which is of the order of a few hundreds, let's say 400, it's already a very, very uh, difficult algorithm to do on a classical computer. So that people usually don't do this. What they do in practice when they want to solve this problem for a large number of tasks or a large number of vertices, they don't do this exponential algorithm anymore because it's too hard. Instead, what they do is what people usually call heuristics. And for instance, one heuristic that people like a lot and that you've probably heard of uh, in classical computer is a divide and conquer heuristic. And this divide and conquer heuristics is quite simple. Is basically, if I draw a graph with a lot of vertices, and let's do something simple. So like this, so I have a graph and I want to compute the MIS of this graph. What most heuristics do is that they pick a subset of the vertices, so the part that I circled in red here, and then they solve the problem for this for this uh, particular problem. And then what they do is that once they've solved for this particular problem, so so this has a cost exponential in in n tilde, where n tilde is the size of this small graph, this small subgraph. Then they get an they get a sol an exact solution for this subgraph, and then basically they do the same thing for the rest, and so on and so forth, so that so that they have partial solutions to the problem for each graph. So if you want, they have they have bit strings, let's say a tilde one, a tilde two. So that's the bit string that is maximum for the second thing, and so on and so forth, a tilde four, and then. The way they they compute the, la the the final solution is by basically putting the bit strings together. So a one, a two, a three, a four. By putting the bits together, of course, it's not correct to do this because since you didn't take into account the links that are here, so between the different subgraphs, you may have strings of vertices which share edges, but but it's very easy to fix. Uh, the solution to remove these edges. When you do this kind of approach, what you see is that you will not necessarily get the optimal solution because to get the optimal solution, you would really need to do to solve the whole problem. And basically, you 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 will probably have suboptimal solutions because you're not treating what hap what what happens at the edge of the subgraphs in in the in a, in a good way. But what you can see, nevertheless, is that you will get a decent enough solution. And the larger uh, the zone here inside the blue circle, so the largest uh, the subgraphs you do, and the better the quality of the solution will, will be. And typically, with this kind of approach, you will return a solution that I can call, for instance, um, so let me call A tilde the solution that I get by putting together the vertices. So let, let me call it this. And this will have a score SA which is smaller or equal than the score of the A star, which would be the best solution if you have enough power to do the exponential algorithm. And what people like to look at, and this will be the main quantity that we'll try to optimize with a quantum computer, what, we, what, we, what people try to optimize is a, a ratio, which is usually called the approximation ratio and is usually called alpha, which is the ratio of S of A tilde over over s of a star so and this ratio is is usually smaller than one in, in all generality so and 
here, what we want to understand is that if you use a classical computer, let's say, so let's take an example. Let's say I have a classical computer and I and I can get solutions with 90% or 0 0.9. And what I want to understand, and this is really the goal of the of, of, of the, the, the quantum part of the lecture, is going to be with a quantum computer, can I get an alpha quantum which is larger than 90%? That will be the goal of the of, of a quantum computing uh, engineer to understand whether you can get uh, a better a better approximation ratio, namely if you can find a better a better algorithm, and this would be the main uh, goal today. And as I will uh, argue, and that's a, a bit of an appetizer, the the answer depends pretty much on the coherence length that you have on your quantum computer, and that's the the goal of the lecture is really to go to this. Uh, to this result. OK, so now let's dive into the quantum computing. Now that the pro problem is defined, uh, let's let's dive into the problem uh, at stake. And so, so to do this, what we need is turn the problem into a quantum problem. Uh, OK, now I lost my mouse here. So let's, let's, let's just see, uh, again, what is the score that I want to optimize. So it's. I want to do the sum of the ni, and I have, and I I want that for all the edges, the ni and j equals zero. So this is my constraint, and I want to maximize this cost function. One thing that we like in physics is is Hamiltonians, and why we like Hamiltonians is that usually physical systems go into the minimum uh, state. Uh, the, the ground state of Hamiltonians. And so here, what we're going, the first task that we're going to have is turn the problem, the optimization problem here in a Hamiltonian. And for this, what we're going to do is first of all, turn this optimization problem uh, into uh, something that looks more similar to Hamiltonian by releasing the constraints. So this is called a relaxation. And here we're going to do something that is also very familiar in physics, which is to introduce. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. So that's a that, that's a good question. So here, we have to, to. So you have to remember that when when I say s of a, s uh, a is 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 a collection of bit strings n one until n until n um, n. So that means that if you give me a bit string, so really n bits, so n bits, what I'm going to do is two things. I'm going to check that sum over n i that sorry that that for all edges, that for all edges in the graphs in the in the graph, I'm going to check that for this particular bit string, it's equal zero. So if 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 I don't find this property, then I just say that this is not a, a solution, or I could put s equal infinity, so or s equals zero. It's a very bad score. I don't accept this solution. And then if it's not the case, so if if I do have this property, then I'm going to return sum over n i over all the bits. Does it make sense? I'll assume yes. Okay. Um, and so. Here, but so maybe it will become clearer when we turn this problem into um, a relaxation problem. So now let me define a new cost function, which is something that you probably uh, will recognize, which is now I'm going to do something where I want to maximize the number of, of vertices in the set, but I'm going to put a penalty whenever a term does not satisfy the constraint. So I'm going to say that my new cost function is going to be the sum for i in the in, in in the vertex set, so in the vertices. And I'm going to remove uh, or put a penalty if I ever have some bits which don't satisfy the constraints. And this is going to be my cost function. And what you can see is that if u is large enough here, if u is large, then there is no way I can have some uh, solutions that violate my constraint. And at the same time, because I have th this first term here, I'm going to try to maximize uh, the size of this, the set in question. 
And that's a very, uh, that, that's something that we do a lot in physics. It's just adding a Lagrangian multiplier here. So U, in a sense, is a Lagrangian, is a, is a Lagrangian multiplier. And so now, once you see such a cost function, you should have a, probably there's a reflex uh, that you have, uh, which is uh, just how, how do you, when you have such a cost function, something that you would like to do, probably if you want to turn it into a quantum problem is to do the following thing. You just rewrite the exact same thing and you and you put hats everywhere and you call this h and since you were doing physics we're not calling it a, we're, we're not we don't want to maximize the hamiltonian usually we want to minimize it so we're going to we're going to add a minus sign here and a plus sign here so we're going to change the sign so that the task that we want to do to perform on a quantum computer is not to maximize the energy of the Hamiltonian, but to lower this, this energy. So here I did nothing. I just turned the Hamiltonian, the, the, the classical cost function into a quantum cost function by just adding hats on the, on the, on, on the variables. Of course, now there is a bit of, uh, I need to say a bit more for you, for you to understand really what it means to put the hats here. And here, so implicitly what I did by adding hats is that I went into a Hilbert space, which is a, a, a Hilbert space of dimension two to the power n. For, and, and so let me call H this Hilbert space. And this H is a collection of small Hilbert spaces that I can call, let's say, small h, tensor, small h, tensor, small h, or each of these small h's is a is a two-level system or a hyperspace of dimension two. And here, what this and two-level systems means that each of one one possible basis, which you saw in Bruno's lecture, uh, is the computational basis, which I I'm going to call zero and one. And the way that I defined that I can define n is that n is the operator such that such that such as when it acts on qubits on, on state zero, you get zero. And when you act on qubits one, you, you, just, you, you get one times the state itself. That's the definition of this operator. And to make a connection to the Pauli operators uh, that uh, you most probably saw before, uh, to have such an operator, you can define it in terms of the Pauli matrix, the sigma z matrix. Namely, if I write the matrix elements, it's going to be 1, 0, 0, 0. So this is in, in, in the basis 0, 1. This is the definition of this operator. So here, this is my the Hamiltonian that I want to solve. And of course, this Hamiltonian is quite special in the sense that if you look at this Hamiltonian uh, as a matrix in the Hilbert space, in the, in the computational basis of the Hilbert space, this matrix is a 2 to the power n times 2 to the power n matrix. And here, in this particular case, it is a diagonal matrix. And so here, during the rest of the lecture, I'm going to focus on this particular problem. But you can imagine that everything I say, or more or less everything I say, will also be correct if it's not a diagonal matrix. In other words, you could replace H by the electronic structure Hamiltonian, for instance. And everything I'm saying will, will basically be correct again. So here, nothing that I'm saying will be very specific to this particular problem. It turns out that it's a diagonal matrix, but it's still a huge matrix because there's two to the power n terms. And I want to find what is the maximum over these two to the power n terms. So it's still an exponential problem. And, but everything I'm saying will also work for, for electronic structure 
Hamiltonians or spin problems, for instance. Okay, so now let's see uh, what we can do now to solve uh, for the ground set of this Hamiltonian. And now I'm going to introduce a method that people use a lot and that you've probably heard of, which is called annealing. Um, and that's a, a quite simple method where basically what, what you do is that you're going to construct an artificial Hamiltonian. So let's say that this is time. And let's say this is, this is yeah, so this is time and or this is a parameter S. Uh, okay, let's be precise. So I'm going to say that this here is a parameter S such that when S equals one, the Hamiltonian of my system here is H. So the Hamiltonian that I, that I want to find the ground state energy of. And when S equals zero, then the Hamiltonian here is a Hamiltonian that I'm going to, to call H naught. And H naught is a Hamiltonian whose ground state is easy to prepare on my quantum computer. And also, uh, yeah, and that's it. So that's 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 what I want to do. And so I'm going to start from this Hamiltonian to the other. So in other words, my Hamiltonian as a function of S is going to be S of H naught, uh, or let's say one minus S times H naught plus S times H. And as you can see, when S equals zero, I get H naught and S equal one, I get H. And what I can do is, is have S depend on T so that, and, and, and decide on such a, such a function such that S of T equals zero is zero. Sorry, oops. Uh, S of T equals zero is zero and S of T large equals one. And now, why do we want to do this? So here we have to suppose that at this point here, we sit in the ground state of H naught. And remember our goal. So here, this is, I'm, so this is the energy here. And what I want to do is go from this state here, and I'm following the energy here, to the ground state here, let's call it E star, for instance, which is the, 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 the minimum cost function for my Hamiltonian. And if I now, I can also draw other energies. So for instance, E1 here would be this, and there could be another energy here. So this is the spectrum of, a, of my Hamiltonian. And at any given time here, what I, what I draw is the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, uh, the current Hamiltonian. And there is an important theorem uh, that tells us that if, so here I'm going to be a bit more precise. I'm going to T large, I'm going to call T final. And the important theorem, which is called the adiabatic theorem, tells me that if TF, is large enough, and I'm going to tell you large, large compared to what, then psi at tie fi at t final is the ground state of H. So that's a very important property that if I go slow, so if, if I go slow slowly enough then the final state of my Hamiltonian is going to be the ground state of H, which means that I can read the state here and the state here is going to be a, a, a series of bits, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, for instance. And here will be the solution to my problem. I just read the ones here and this is these are the vertices inside the maximum independent set. And why am I guaranteed that my final state 
is just one bit string, so one of the computational basis sets. This is because my Hamiltonian is diagonal. So if it's diagonal, I know that one of the solutions is the, the one of the basis states, diagonal Hamiltonian. Of course, the answer will be a bit different if H is not diagonal, so if you have a chemistry problem, in which case you will have a superposition of this of, of these elements, but in that case, you're not interested in one particular bit string, you're interested in the entangled state. So, and now let's come to what is the parameter that is important uh, to compare the final time with. Well, basically, what you have to look at is the gap between the first excited state and the ground state, which we, which you can, you can call gamma. And there, it turns out that if you go over time, there is one point where this gamma, this sorry, delta is minimum. And what you want is you want TF to be larger than some const, some constant over delta mean square. So in other words, if you have a problem where you, suppose you were to know what is the spectrum, you could compute what is the minimum gap over the evolution, the adiabatic evolution. And what you need to choose is a final time which is large enough with respect compared to one over this, this gap squared. Okay, um, now there is one point that I didn't address yet is what is this H naught? And so to, uh, to and there, what I told you is that I, I should choose an H naught whose ground state I already know and which is easy to prepare. One example that people like to use a lot is taking H naught as sum over I of sigma X I, so i from one to n. And as you probably know, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is the state that people sometimes call plus, 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 where the plus state is defined as zero plus one over square root two. And that's a, that's you, that's a state that's a, a, a Hamiltonian that people like to use a lot uh, to start uh, their computation. Um, and and yeah, that's it. So that's that's a that's a state that's a Hamiltonian that people like to take a lot uh, when they do Hamiltonians, but they, you could choose something else. Okay, and now um, I'm going to do uh, maybe a first an, another small quiz uh, to to know. To, so, so that you can build intuition about what is happening. So let's switch to this, this next quiz. So here, uh, this is something I didn't really tell you the answer. So it's more, so here I'm appealing to your intuition. Here, what I drew, for instance, here is the energy of the final state when you do uh, the adiabatic evolution. And this is the annealing time TF. So this is the TF here in the x-axis. And I would like you to think about what you think is the right answer. Uh, if you start from uh, an initial state, for instance, psi zero of H naught, and, and you want to, com and you're computing the energy uh, that you get at the final state. So here, the small annealing times means, means that you go very fast and long annealing times means you go very uh, slowly. And here, the red dashed line corresponds to the exact ground state energy. So the one that you would have gotten if you had diagonalized your Hamiltonian exactly on a classical computer, or if you have done the exponential classical computation. So there's three possibilities. Basically, the one I showed, then something where you go up and down, and then some solution here where you start going down and then up again. And so the answer is quite easy for this particular case. So here we, we suppose we do perfect quantum annealing. Namely, we can really do this evolution on an analog quantum computer. There is no noise, no decoherence, no problems. The only parameters you can play with, the only parameter you can play with is uh, the final annealing time. So that really how fast you go when you're doing your annealing. Okay, let's see what you guys think. Okay, so I think more or less everybody agrees on, on this answer, which is the correct one, uh, which is that basically here, this is what one expects is that the longer 
the longer you go, so the longer you do your adiabatic uh, evolution for, uh, the better solution you get in the end. And an intuition for why you get this solution uh, is that if you go too fast, if you go too fast, what happens is that you start here in this state. So let me maybe draw. So you start here in yellow, and then if you go too fast, there's a chance that you're going, going to go up in energy and end up in the first excited state, for instance. And that's why you have to go slow. OK, so now in practice, there's so that's not the way it works in real life, because in real life, you have a lot of different problems that can uh, emerge. One first problem that, you, that can emerge is that your Hamiltonian as a function of time, h of s, is a Hamiltonian, which, as I said, is 1 minus s times sum over i from i to n of sigma xi, and then plus s times sum over i of ni minus u, sum over ij, ni, nj. So this is the Hamiltonian that, that you're supposed to be able to realize in the lab if you want your procedure to work. It turns out that building such a Hamiltonian in the lab is not that easy. Um, there is one platform that can realize a Hamiltonian which is quite similar to this Hamiltonian, which is called the Rydberg, uh, so Rydberg platform, Rydberg type of quantum computer. And here is the Hamiltonian that Rydberg platform realizes. So it's a H which depends on T. And basically what you can do on these machines is, is omega T over two times sigma I of sigma X one. Then you can control also a term which is very similar to the second term of the target Hamiltonian. And also uh, what you can do, oh, and I forgot that there was minus and plus here. So minus, there you go. And then, so this is these are really uh, standard terms when you do quantum computing and they have some names even. So this, this is called a, a Rabi term. This here is called a detuning term. So it's something that should be very familiar to people doing atomic physics. And then there's a term here which basically has to do with the interaction between the Rydberg atoms, which is this term here, where you have an interaction between, uh, uh, between atoms, which scales as one over the distance to the power six between the atoms. And th there you, you might have recognized a Van der Waals type of interactions. And now if we squint as at these two Hamiltonians, you, we can check uh, that there are some uh, differences and some analogies. So basically on the analogy side, we can see that the Rabi term are basically very similar if you, if you can control omega t as you want. The detuning term here is also quite similar. The main difference here uh, comes from the fact that uh, you have a different uh, a different term here, because here basically you cannot really decide on what is the interaction in the sense that here the interaction that you have in your real physical problem is an interaction which is not just among neighbors in the graph, but it depends on the distance and uh, between two atoms, so that the interaction is not exactly the same. And and this is. Uh, a source of imperfection in the sense that if you use Rydberg platforms to do your annealing procedure, probably the ground state that you will get for your Rydberg Hamiltonian will not be the one, the, the, the exact one that you have, that you expected uh, if you were to use the Hamiltonian that you like, namely this Hamiltonian here. So that's, that's a source of error uh, that people have to deal with when they when they use this kind of platform to solve this problem. So that's 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 one thing, but it wouldn't really be a problem if we didn't have more problems which, which have to come from decoherence. Nevertheless, uh, before I, I go into this, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit uh, about a variational uh, approach to solve, to solve this problem in a, let's say, imperfect way, but still you can get better results than annealing. And this method is called the variational quantum simulation.
And it's basically the analog counterpart of VQE that Bruno mentioned. And the way it works uh, is quite similar. It's, it's, it's very similar in spirit to VQE. The way it works is the following. The Hamiltonian whose Bronsted energy you're really interested in is this Hamiltonian here that I'm going to call the target Hamiltonian. So this is going to be H target. And my goal is going to be to find the Bronsted energy of this Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian, which you can really control in the lab, is this Hamiltonian here, the, the Hamiltonian, for instance, of the Rydberg platform, or any other Hamiltonian that you can engineer in the lab. And this is the one that people have called H resource. And this H resource depends on parameters that you can tweak at will in order to find uh, the ground state of H targets. So in other words, here, I'm going to call theta here, the, the the parameters of this Hamiltonian. So here, theta in, in, in our particular case can be delta of t. It could be uh, omega of t, sorry, delta of t. It could also be the atom positions, for instance. And these are degrees of freedom that you can adjust in a clever way in order to find a, a ground state whose energy is close to the ground state energy of the target energy. Or let me, be, let me say things a bit differently. Once you've chosen some, some theta or some de omega t, delta t, or R y, R i, and you do your time evolution, at the end, you're going to get a, a state, a final state psi that depends on theta. And once you have gotten this state, you can measure the energy psi theta on each target. And I'm going to call this energy E theta. And that's a notation you probably have seen in VQE. And now what you're going to do is you're going to, to do an iterative procedure where you pick a, a given theta. You do your time evolution with the resource Hamiltonian to get psi theta. You measure the target energy on the quantum computer. And with the energy that you get, you're going to choose a new theta in order to, to, to minimize the energy in an iterative fashion. So you see it's very similar to VQE. The only difference is that here, to get your, uh, your wave function, your final wave function, you're not going to do an evolution in the form of a gate-based uh, evolution. So it's not a quantum circuit. It's, it's just you're, you're changing the parameters of your Hamiltonian uh, over time. And for instance, if you do annealing, you could view annealing as a kind of variational procedure where the parameter that you play with is the, the, the annealing time. But here it's a very trivial uh, problem because you know that the longer this annealing time, the better the solution. So you know that you should take uh, t annealing time to infinity to get the optimal solution. But if you go to this VQS formalism, then you're free basically to choose something maybe shorter than annealing to reach the same to, to reach a better solution. And now the reason why you want to do this uh, is because of decoherence, which I'm going to go into in a moment. But now before we go really into the math of decoherence, I want maybe to ask you a question about what you think is going to happen if you add some noise to the system and and, and, and here we're going to look at the energy that you get at the, at the end of this, this annealing procedure in the presence of decoherence. So I'm going to ask the same question as before here. But now, what do you think is going to happen to your final energy still when do doing this very simple annealing procedure? But this time you put decoherence and you want to under so what we want to know is whether you're going to get this kind of graph, this kind of graph, or this kind of graph. So these are the same graphs as before, but now we want to understand how the situation changes when we add decoherence. 
Okay, let's check. Okay, so, so now most people tell me that's the result that we expect. And so let, let's try to get a, an intuition why this is indeed the case. So what is happening is that if you if you do sh very short annealing and you, s you slowly increase the annealing time, then your results are going to get better because of the adiabatic theorem. You need to go slow enough to get better results. Now, if you have a very long annealing time, then noise in your quantum computer is going to have a larger influence. In other words, the longer you wait, the more errors you will collect during your time evolution. So you, you're going to have results which, which get worse and worse with time. And worse here means uh, higher energy. And that means that there, there's a sweet sweet spot here where the which which is the optimal annealing time. And this is a sweet spot that you want to find uh, if you're doing uh, annealing in the presence of decoherence. And now in the remaining uh, in the re remaining time, I'm going to explain to you a bit more about the formalism of how to describe decoherences in more detail and how to make such a computation for real. Because here, this is just a sketch, but now we want to understand how to make such a computation for real. So let's, let's uh, dive into this now. So now I'm going to... To, so let's say this was part 1a, and this is now part b about decoherence. And for this, uh, I'm going to, to recall a bit uh, what is happening, uh, really starting from the very beginning. If, we, if I want to know the time evolution of a wave function, there's one equation that you all know, which is the Schrodinger equation, which is given by basically, which is this equation here. Now, and the H resource is the one that I mentioned. So for instance, the Rydberg Hamilton. One question, one question. Oh, yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, yes. Okay, so so the question is that uh, the converged solution can be fractional. So in other in other words, when you do your evolution uh, at the end, so let me so if you can see my screen, the way that I interpret the question is that it could be that, for instance, the final state the final state psi t final is let's say zero zero one plus I don't know zero 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 over square root two if you have three atoms. In which case, this is a fractional occupation. In particular, uh, the last bit here has fractional occupation is, uh, 0, 0 0.5, right? Is, is it what you have in mind? Yes. Well, this can happen. And in this case, this just means that the, these two solutions um, are equivalent. And if you draw your histogram, so if you do, draw the histogram of all the bit strings, so 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. So there are eight bit strings. Then you would see a, a histogram like this, and then all the rest is zero. And here, by looking at the most frequent uh, uh, bit strings here, you would see what is the solution that your quantum computer has found in this particular case. Of course, what you so it could be first of all that there are several uh, independent sets which have the same size, which would in which case you would probably you would have a degenerate state and therefore fractional occupation. So that would be one case. And in most cases, I would say that if your algorithm works well, probably you would, you would, you would find that one bit string has a, very large, has a very large probability if you have only one solution to your problem. And then there is some, some residual weight on other bit strings because you have some errors coming from a finite annealing time or, or a difference between the target Hamiltonian and the resource Hamiltonian. But yes, this can happen. Do I know? I don't know. I don't know because I want to maximize it. So, um, so, but hopefully, if I go slowly enough, because I'm I'm going to the ground state of the Hamiltonian that I want, which has this penalty term, and 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 wants to maximize some over n i, I'm going to go to a state which has a very large n i, and that's the magic of the annealing. But I don't know it in advance. Okay. You're welcome.
Okay, so now let's go uh, into uh, Anili, uh, into into noise. Sorry. So, and we're going to take a very simple example where, just to be very concrete, I'm going to 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 call H resource. I'm going to call it H for now. And I'm going to say that to be very so instead of I'm going to take a, a slightly different notation. Uh, it's going to be delta over two times sigma z, and which shouldn't scare you too much because n and sigma z are very similar. There's only one identity between those two terms, so that's basically the same up to an identity. So I'm going to simplify h to sigma over two to delta over two sigma z, and then I'm going to really add noise on this Hamiltonian. And noise is really going to be what you expect it to be. So H noisy is going to be delta plus some epsilon, which depends on T over two of sigma Z. And this epsilon of T is really something that is noise. So, so, so this is, this is a, a random field which, which oscillates over time. And decoherence is much, it is not much more than just that. And so, if you now want to integrate this equation uh, starting from a state, let's say you start from psi t equals zero in a superposition state, for instance, because that's the state that we started from. So this is the final fi famous plus state. And you do the time evolution. So if you integrate this equation, then what you find at the end uh, of, if you integrate this Schrodinger equation is one over square root two, of zero plus exponential of i, um, so of of delta t. So let me check. Uh, so here, what you get is uh, yes. So delta t h bar uh, t. So delta t over h bar, uh, and I should and I forgot the minus sign here minus the integral from zero to t of epsilon t dt i over h bar, if I made no mistake, times one. So this is the kind of result that you get. And what I can say is that I, I could rewrite this term here as exponentials minus i phi, which depends on t. And here, what you the important thing to notice once you've done this, is that phi of t is now delta times t. And so let's forget the h bars here. I'm going to put the h bars here. Delta times t, then plus an integral of, okay, here I should put a, tau, a t bar here to make it correct, of epsilon of t bar dt bar. So what what you see, what you can see here here is that if you had had no noise, so if epsilon were zero, this term here would be gone. And in other words, in the absence of in the absence of noise, in the absence of noise, what would what would have happened is that you would have just delta t, so there would be a dephasing that comes to your system, but uh, so this would be, let's say, a normal dephasing happening to your system. But now, if you add some noise, you see that if you do the integral over your noise, and I, and I re really remind you that this noise is a stochastic field, if you do this, the integral over your noise, you're going to have a, an additional dephasing to your, your wave function. So in other words, the, the, what this kind of noise does is that it dephases your wave function in a way that you don't really want. And I can try to do a picture, uh, so a different picture in the block sphere. Um, so let me try to do this now, if I find the right thing here. So you probably saw already sometimes this kind of graph here where, here this is the block sphere, and this is zero, this is one. And so my initial state on the block sphere was this state here, which I call plus. And usually if you if you just let the system evolve 
with time, uh, what is going to happen is that you're going to rotate around the block sphere. So on the on the equator, so you're going to rotate here. But now what we can do is stay in the in the in the frame, uh, in the frame, uh, the rotating frame uh, at this delta rotation. So if you if we stay in the rotation rotating field uh, at delta, then what you can see is that if you had no dephasing noise, so not this epsilon were zero zero, you wouldn't move in this frame. Now, with noise, what happens is that you have a small dephasing here that is this integral of epsilon between times 0 and t. So that's, that's one first thing to notice, is that what noise does in this particular case is that you're going to get a, defa a dephasing in the wave function, and, and this dephasing is something you, don't, you do not really want. Now, there's a second important thing, is that if you redo the same experiment a second time, then the noise is going to be different the second time around. So in other words, the first time, maybe your noise looks like this, but the second time your noise looks like this. The important thing is that, so this noise is statistically the same uh, for the first or the second realization, or in other words, if you look at the, at the average of the noise of, so for instance, epsilon t, is something that is doesn't depend on t, it's fixed. It doesn't depend on the realization. And also, if you look at the correlations, they're also something that is deterministic. For instance, this is deterministic. But one realization, one sample of the noise is different. So if you redo the experiment, the final wave function is going to be different. And so that also means that if you now measure uh, if you, if you now want to measure something in your system, so let's say you want to measure uh, an observable O at time t, usually what you would have done would be just to use old quantum mechanics and say, okay, my the value of the observable at, at time t is just the sandwich of my observable with the wave function. That's what you would have done in usual quantum mechanics. But here, since you're working with stochastic fields, this epsilon is a stochastic quantity, you need to take into account the fact that this is a stochastic variable. So in other words, the, the, the phase here, phi, that I defined just here, so in yellow here, is a stochastic field. So you need to include the fact that your final wave function here depends on phi. And this is a very important result that to compute your observables O of t, you need to do this. And now let's do a couple of manipulations to this expression. So here, what I can do here is remark that this is a scalar number, so I can write it as trace of the same thing. And then by cyclicity of the trace, I can put the psi in front like this. And then by linearity, I can put the trace outside and look at what, uh, what I have inside. So you see here that once I've done this computation, I have put something inside a trace, and this something is the observable, whose average energy I want, and some object here. And this object here, I'm going to give a name to, and it's going to called rho. And this row is called the density matrix of the system. And this is the central object that people work with when they do noisy simulations or when they want to talk about decoherence. So let us uh, take a step back. So here I have defined an object row, which is the average over realizations of ket psi times bra psi. And once I have the density matrix of my system, I can compute the average value of any observable as trace of rho times this observable. So that now, instead of using the Schrodinger equation, I'm going to be interested in finding the time evolution of this, uh, of this new object. And this is really what, what people uh, are going to do. And let me give you maybe a slightly different way of uh, defining the, the density matrix. You could also, and that's what some people do, you could also define it as being the sum 
over i of some discrete probability pi times psi i psi i. So this is exactly the same thing as before, except here, use, uh, instead of using a uh, continuous probability density, here what I use is a discrete probability. And, and But you should understand, uh, I mean, the, the meaning behind this density matrix is, ex is exactly the same. And in other words, an intuitive way of seeing such a state, so this, this density matrix really describes the quantum state of your system. It means that my system is in state psi i with probability pi. So this is this really this is what it means when you see such a density matrix. You no longer know for certain what is the state of your system. So you, the state of your system is not psi i anymore. It's a it's a it's a it's a statistical mixture of state psi i with some probability pi. And that's, uh, so that's a very important result. And of course you can recover the quantum mechanics that you're uh, used to. Uh, if you consider the case where, for instance, P1 equals one and P for I larger than one equals zero. So if you, if you, if you find this case here, then it means that rho is psi one, psi one. And then that's what you're used to seeing in general is that then you know that the state of your system is psi one with probability one and and so for 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 those who want to know a bit more you know so the, the the criterion that people look at is the rank of the density matrix so if the rank of rho is equal one then you know that it's so you know you know with so it's a dis, dis, deterministic state or what people call a pure state. And when rank is larger than one, then that's what people call a mixed state. Namely, you're in a statistical mixture of states. And now just as a small illustration, when you draw quantum states, usually what you do is that your quantum states sit, so for instance, here or here or here or here, but they always sit on the surface of the block sphere. That's when you're talking about pure states psi. Now, if you talk about a, a density matrix, this density matrix in general sits inside of the block sphere. So it's really a point that is inside the sphere in the volume, not necessarily on the surface of the sphere. And this is a very uh, a very important uh, result. And let me uh, maybe give something uh, a bit more intuitive to connect with the example that I took, the defacing example. So in the defacing example, I had told you that if we go in the rotating frame, basically sometimes I'm going to deface a bit this way and sometimes a bit this way, sometimes a bit this way because of this defacing noise, depending on the noise realization. Now, if I do the average of these three arrows, what you can quite easily see is that the, the average is going to be a vector here, which points toward uh, the state that you would have gotten in the absence of noise, but it's shorter. So you see here, I drew, uh, I drew something that is shorter. So, so or if, if I look from the above here, that's the equator, and that's the state that I would have liked to, to get. But sometimes I get a state like this, sometimes like this, sometimes like this. And I, if I do now uh, uh, an average of all these states, you see that I get something that is like this. So it's shorter, it's shorter than the states that I should have got. And this is, a, this is also another characterization of mixed states. These are the states that are inside the block sphere. All right, so now, uh, now that we have this density matrix, what we would like to have is the, the analog of the density matrix uh, the, of the Schrodinger equation for the density matrix. Because you know, so in quantum mechanics, you know that if you want to know the time evolution, you need the Schrodinger equation. Now we would like to devise a similar, uh, to have a similar equation, but for density matrices. 
And here, so I'm not going to to derive anything because it would take too much time. But instead, I'm going to give you directly uh, an equation that people like to use a lot when they look at the time evolution of the density matrix. And it's called the Lindblad equation. And this Lindblad equation is, give, is, is the following. So it's given as H H bar T to DT, D rho DT, commutator of H of T with rho, minus I over two, sum over I of anti commutator of L I L I, L I dagger L I rho minus two L I rho L I. So this is the Lindblad equation. As you can see, it's a differential equation. And so at this stage, it might look a bit uh, too fast for you, of course. So I didn't really derive uh, this equation. But let's let's look a bit more uh, at a at a at a, uh, a slightly different result in the absence of noise. So let's suppose I don't have noise, and so that means that rho is psi to so psi t psi t. And I want to, under, to to know what is the time evolution of rho. Then I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to differentiate rho with respect with time. And so I, what, what do I get? I get E h bar d psi dt times psi plus psi t times i h bar d psi dt, so I do just differentiate the product. And then here I can use the fact that I recognize Schrodinger, h psi psi. And here I also recognize Schrodinger again, except that now I have, uh, so that I need, I need to be careful that I get minus psi t h. So that at the end of the day, oops, and there's no IH bar anymore. No. So that's that's what you get when you do when you do this. And what you find is that you find H rho minus rho H, which is the commutator here. And this equation has a name, it's called the, the, the von Neumann equation. And so if we compare this equation here with the equation that I gave, you see that the first term in, in the Lindblad equation is the term that I would have gotten in the absence of noise. And then there's a second term here, which is sometimes called the dissipator. So sometimes people call it the D of rho, so the dissipator here. And this dissipator encodes the fact that there is the coherence in your system. And there's a major, a very important object in this dissipator here. And this is, these are these operators Li, which are called the jump operators, or Lindblad operators. And they tell us something about the noise. And they're different for, for different quantum computers. And basically, if you want to know what is your decoherence, you need to know the form, the precise form of these jump operators. And of course, if Li equals zero, then you go back to the noiseless case. And so now what I suggest we do uh, for the last five or 10 minutes um, is take a look at a very simple example of uh, Li. And I'm going to take an example, which is really a textbook example, which is let's Suppose that Li, so, so that's a special case, where we suppose that Li equals square root of gamma, where gamma is a number, times sigma z. So there's, and, and let's say there's only one, so I'm going to drop the index here, the, the i index here. So we're going to work with only one qubit, and I'm going to suppose the Hamiltonian is zero, just, just to, to make it simpler. Then what happens is that your Lindblad equation becomes 
IH0DT. And if you if you do the math, so so we let's do do it quickly. So we, you have L dagger L rho anti commutator minus two L L like this. So here, if you do sigma z times sigma z, this is identity, and you collect in front the the coefficient gamma. And so if you do this carefully, what you should find is minus i gamma, and then rho minus sigma z, rho sigma z. And so let's do this for a given form of rho equals a b b star c. So now what, what we wrote is b of a b b star c dt. And this is basically, now if we do, uh, if we do it carefully, ta -ta -ta, so I'm going to remove the IH bar left and right. So the only thing that remains is minus gamma. And then here I have, so you see that the A, so there's A, B, B star, C. And if I do the product of the sigma Z matrix left and right, what I end up with is basically A minus B, minus b star and then c so that in the end i get minus gamma and zero to b to b star zero and so now i'm ready to integrate this equation because i basically see that da dt equals dc dt equals zero and i have that db dt is minus two gamma times b so at the end of the day the result that we get is that the wave function, the, the density matrix as a function of time is the following is, is A, so, so nothing here, so A of t equals zero, then B of t equals zero, exponential of minus two gamma t. So here complex conjugate here, and here I get C of t equals zero. So, so this was a bit quick, I guess, but let's look at the form of this density matrix. And let's suppose that we started from a state which was a superposition state. So let's suppose we started from t equals zero, which was plus plus, which means one half, one half, one half. Then what happens is that as a function of time, I get one half, then exponential of minus two gamma t over two, exponential of minus two gamma t over two, and one half. So that at t equals infinity, what I get is a state one half, one half. Okay, let's take a bit of time now to see, uh, to see this result. So I started from a state with this density matrix and I got to a state with this density matrix. And here I could write it in a slightly different way. This is one half, zero, zero, plus one half, one, one. And that's where I'm going to, so I'm going to end on this uh, for, for this first part of the lecture. What I did, what, what this dephasing noise did, and this was, as you could see, it's, it was a very simple example, is that I started from the state zero plus one over square root two, which, which is a state where you say that the state of the system is zero and one at the same time. And de what decoherence did is that I started from this state, which is a superposition state, and I ended up in a state, which is a state where I'm zero with, with 50% probability, or I'm one with 50% probability. So here, what dephasing noise did was really to go from a quantum state, which is zero and one, to a classical state, which is zero or one. So that's something that you probably heard a lot of times before. This is the famous Schrodinger cat picture, where you go from dead and alive, which is the quantum state, to something which is dead or alive, which is a classical state, which, which we're used to in the macroscopic world. And this Lindblad equation is really the equation that contains this kind of physics, and this is really the key uh, tool that people use to study and simulate decoherence 
in quantum computers. So I think um, I'm going to stop here uh, for, uh, for for this uh, first part and maybe show uh, one result. So really, once you if you solve this equation on a numeric uh, on a on a classical computer on a big HPC computer and you look at the results, I'm going just to show you the kind of plots that you can get when you do the the real computations, so not just on the blackboard. That's so. That's the kind of graph that you get. So here I plot already the kind of plot that I showed you in the in, in the in the previous uh, questions, uh, multiple choice questions. So that's the energy as a function of the annealing time. And here I did several computations. One where I take no noise, so I, there's no gamma. So gamma equals zero. That's the black curve. And here what you see is what you expect, namely that as I increase the annealing time. I get a better and better solution. And here I have to say that minus three, here is the best energy that I can get. That's the energy of the perfect solution. So you see that the, the adiabatic theorem indeed works in this example. You get better and better solutions as annealing time is larger and larger. Now, as you increase the coherence, so if you go from black to blue uh, to red here, you see here that you start going down, but at some point noise kills your solution. So you, you go to a more classical state and so and so you, you destroy the power of, of quantum computing and you get a state which basically loses uh, information and therefore is no longer very interesting for your for solving your classical problem. And that's so that's the intuition you already had when you did the, the multiple choice question, but that's also what one gets. When one, when one does um, a computation with a lot of atoms. So here it's only six atoms, but you can go to, to, to a couple of tens of atoms when you do these simulations. And I think I'm going to stop here for the first part uh, of the question. And of, of course, I'm happy to take uh, questions for this first part.